There's a story of two men. They were uh, just shooting the breeze, having a conversation about life, and the conversation took them to the topic of religion. And uh, one, the one guy turned to his friend and he said, I bet you don't even know the Lord's Prayer. And uh, his friend says, wait a minute. Uh, I do too know the Lord's Prayer. And he pulls out a 20 and he says, I bet you I can say the Lord's Prayer perfectly. And so he, or the, the, I'm sorry, the, the friend said, I, I just messed up the whole story. <laughs> the friend said, I bet you can't say the Lord's Prayer. And he put $20 down on it. And the friend says, oh, I can. And he confidently says, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. His friend interrupted him, handed him the 20. He said, I thought for sure you didn't know it. Uh, We come this morning to probably one of the most well-known prayers that we find in the Bible. Uh, We've been journeying through the Sermon on the Mount, probably one of the greatest sermons in the Bible. It's the message of Jesus as he proclaims what kingdom people look like. What people who have chosen to follow Jesus and received his grace and forgiveness and his righteousness and what their life will look like if they become people of the kingdom. And and we come this morning to a moment in Jesus' teaching where he says, this then is how you should pray. Most of us know it as the Lord's Prayer. I shared last week that I think it's perhaps a misnomer that we call it that because it's really the disciples' prayer. It's what Jesus is teaching the disciples to pray. We have another account in Luke chapter 11 where the disciples come to Jesus and they say, Lord, teach us to pray. And the answer that he gives is the words that we know as the Lord's prayer. I would venture to say that while it is one of the most well-known prayers in Scripture, it is also perhaps one of the most used passages, most misused passages of Scripture. You see, just before these words that we find in Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, Jesus gives a warning. A warning about how we uh, are prone to pray. And we looked at that passage last week, how all of us are prone to hypocrisy. We're prone to put on certain masks in certain communities that we have. And we, we put on the mask of religiosity. And, and, and then we live differently on Monday or Tuesday at work or in our home. We're we're prone to hypocrisy, and what Jesus is warning us against is empty prayers. He says it in Matthew chapter 6, verse 7. He says, when you pray, do not keep babbling like the pagans, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. This word babble is literally just saying a gibberish as if the words themselves were a magic formula before God. Many people who perhaps were raised in certain church traditions, the Lord's Prayer has been just that. It's something that's recited. It's something that's said as perhaps a a magic formula before God that if we say those words, perhaps God will forgive us. Or if we say those words, uh, God will uh, look more favorably upon us. I th- find it interesting, uh, during uh, some of uh, my time in seminary, I traveled around and preached at different places, and I would lead services at, at churches. One of the things I like to do is rock the boat. And uh, one of the things I would do is I, I love to uh, challenge people, and actually I've, I've never done it here at this church, but uh, I, I love to challenge people to say the Lord's Prayer in a different version or different words than we know. And, and if we are uncomfortable with that, we are missing the point of the Lord's Prayer. 
I, I, because one of the things I want us to do over the next several weeks is step back from these words that we know and really ask, how then should we pray? Because I think what Jesus is teaching us is, number one, I think it is a valuable uh, set of words for us to recite as a church. And that's why we do it each week in our weekly service. I think it is a valuable tool to let these words get ingrained in our minds and in our memory. But... As we've seen all throughout the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' concern is not the words. His concern is not your actions. He's concerned with your heart. And what I'd like for us to do is step back in the, over the next several weeks and ask, what is the heart of the Lord's Prayer? What is Jesus really trying to teach us? Because he says in verse 9, this then is how you should pray. He doesn't say what you should pray. It's how. And I think Jesus is teaching us here in this moment, he's teaching us the attitudes and the motivation that drives prayer. This morning, we are going to take a look at verse 9. They're just one verse, the beginning phrases of the Lord's prayer. And as we do, we Consider this morning the place that Jesus starts in prayer. The place where prayer begins. He says, Our Father in heaven. One of the things that I think Jesus is pushing us toward in this prayer is a realization that Jesus is closer than we realize. That Jesus, that, that, that God is nearer than you realize. This word, Father, it's a word that drives us to the goodness and intimacy of a Father who loves us deeper than perhaps our earthly experience of fatherhood. I shared last week that many of us have mixed uh, relationships with our earthly father, but when it comes to our heavenly father, we find a father who perfectly exemplifies everything we long for in a father. That love, that pr protection, that affirmation. God is a good good father. And Jesus begins this prayer on the basis that God is closer than we realize, because I think often when it comes to prayer, we feel so distant. It feels like God is this mysterious force out there, and Jesus grounds us in the reality that God is a father who is nearer than we realize. One of the words that we use in theological terms to describe the nearness of God is a word called imminence. It, we often talk about the imminence of God, that he is a God who is near, that he is accessible to us as humans. And what we realize here is Jesus begins with this phrase, Our Father, is not only does Jesus proclaim a God who is near, but a God who has adopted us. A God who in His goodness has said, I am giving you a new family. And what I think Jesus is really setting up here in the Lord's Prayer is a prayer that cannot be prayed by anyone who has not put their faith in Jesus. Because Jesus is not saying God is, some people might take this to mean like God is the father of creation. He created everything and so he's our father. But I think Jesus is being very specific here to say that God is a father who adopts as his own those who put their faith in him. And so, while, as we begin this prayer, we, we ground our prayers 
we begin our prayers with the realization that God is nearer than we realize, and, and in that we have a confidence in God's goodness. A confidence in the goodness of God. But in the next two words of this prayer, Jesus takes us from Jesus' goodness that grounds us in the closeness of God to the greatness of God. He says, our Father in heaven. Or as we recite it, our Father who art in heaven. I always wondered what kind of art God does in heaven. And then I looked at the clouds and, and that gave me a picture. But God is a Father and that grounds us in God's nearness, His imminence. And then we have in heaven, in the word that we use to describe God's bigness, his, his majesty, his sovereignty, is a word called transcendence. That God is bigger, he's outside of time, he's outside of our universe. He is bigger than our minds can comprehend. And so just in four words of Jesus' prayer, we have that God is closer than we realize and he's bigger than we imagine. You see, we have a good, good father who is a great, great God. And I think that what Jesus is doing here is he's giving us uh, two seemingly uh, opposite things. A father who is near and a God who is great. And in the Jewish mindset, when Jesus is teaching his disciples to pray, this is, this is bringing in two concepts that were often thought about in different categories. And Jesus puts it in one breath, in one prayer. The goodness of God and the greatness of God. And so in that same breath, we have a realization, a confidence in God's goodness as our Father, and a humility and a reverence in God's greatness as our king who reigns over the universe. And so I would venture to say that as Jesus leads us and teaches us to pray, that one of the things Jesus wants us to ground our prayers in is both the goodness and the greatness of God. I wanted to order it in time for uh, our, my sermon here this morning, but I, I couldn't get shipping fast enough. But uh, you've see, may have probably seen these shirts that Jesus is my homeboy. Um, it, there is this notion among Christian circles of, of Jesus being this uh, best friend, buddy, homeboy of mine. And, and one of the things that we have in this prayer is that Jesus is closer than you realize. He is a good, good father, but you cannot divorce that. You cannot separate it from his greatness as the king over all. And so in the same breath of prayer, we have a confidence and a humility. We have comfort and we have a just reverence for who God is. So when we pray our Father in heaven, we are bringing together the imminence of God and the transcendence of God, the goodness of God and the greatness of God, the nearness of God and the bigness of God. And what Jesus is leading us to is that prayer is grounded in, the prayer begins with us trying to wrap our minds around a God who is bigger than our minds can comprehend, and yet is grounded in a realization that Jesus came and he says, whoever has seen me has seen the Father, and he is a God who is near to us. And he is a God who welcomes us into his arms like children. You see, God is nearer than we realize, and he's higher, he's bigger, he's greater than we imagine. And our response is the second line of the Lord's prayer. He says, hallowed be your name. 
Mary is often a sounding board for me as I prepare my sermons. Sometimes my ideas are a pie in the sky and she helps ground me. And so I said, what do you think of when you pray the words, hallowed be your name? She said, I always picture a hollow tree and uh, hallowed be your name. M many of us, this word is just a foreign concept. Uh, uh, it's it's, it's an old English phrase, and many translations have kept it because throughout, the Lord's Prayer has been cited throughout the centuries. As we look at church literature throughout church history, from as early as the first century, the disciples of Jesus and the early church recited this prayer in their services. And so there are some pieces of tradition that we keep in here. But hallowed is not a word that you use in everyday speech. I doubt any of us will use it tomorrow in our everyday language and conversations, but it is a word that means to sanctify, uh, to make holy, to make set apart. And what's interesting is if, if, if we insert that here into the prayer, it, we, Jesus is teaching us to ask God to sanctify his name. But if we if we think about that, God's name is holy. God's, and all throughout scripture, we have this picture of God's name being the very core of who he is. When Moses, uh, it, when God reveals himself to Moses, God's, God reveals his name to him. When God uh, sends Moses to go and to Pharaoh to say, let my people go. And he, Moses' question is, when they ask what your name is, what will I tell them? And, and so all throughout scripture, the name of God becomes this picture of the wholeness of who God is. And so Jesus teaches us to pray, Lord, sanctify your name. But God's name is already holy. As we think about sanctification, that is the process that God does in the believer's life to move us toward holiness. But God's name is already holy. And so what is Jesus teaching us to pray? Jesus is teaching us to have a passion to have a to make the desire of our hearts that the holiness of God's name would be made holy here. And one of the things we see as the Lord's Prayer goes on is, is this up there, down here kind of mentality. He says, let your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And what Jesus is teaching us to pray for is for really an invasion of God's kingdom in our lives, in our world, such that God makes his name holy by making us holy. By making the passion of our lives for his glory and for his name. And and. And what I love about this, as we just sit and just kind of marinate here in the first two lines of Jesus' prayer, is Jesus is showing us that the goodness of God and the greatness of God lead us to make our lives for the glory of God. You see, when we start to wrap our minds upon the good, where the goodness of God collides with the greatness of God, and I believe that that's at the cross of Jesus where Jesus came in the fullness of all who God is, and he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And we experience at the cross of Jesus the collision of God's goodness, his nearness, his closeness, and his greatness, his holiness, his justice. And there we find the mercy of God. And what Jesus is teaching us to do in our prayers is to start with who God is. And let that collision of concepts that are bigger than we imagine and nearer than we realize to lead us to say, God, I want your glory, your name, your fame to be made great in my life, in our church, in our community. You see, with the goodness of God and the greatness of God lead us to give glory to God. 
And I, I don't think that the Lord's Prayer is meant to be a template for all of our prayers. I, I don't think that Jesus is saying this is the only way to pray. He, teach, he prays in different ways throughout Scripture. And Paul teaches us to pray in other ways throughout Scripture. But I think that one of the things that we need to take away from the Lord's Prayer is that so often our prayers start with us, with our name, with our concerns, with our needs, our desires. And the Lord's Prayer starts with, God, you're, bi- you're closer than I realize and you're bigger than I imagine. And I want my life, I want this prayer, I want the desire and the passion of my life to be about your name and not mine. And so I encourage you, so often uh, my prayer life is centered around me. And I encourage you to set aside times of prayer where it's just about God and his name and his glory, his renown. And you say, God, I want you to be lifted up. I want my life to be uh, 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 all about hollowing your name, sanctifying your name, lifting high your name and not mine. And God, would you, would you, in that moment, in the beginning lines of this prayer, we have almost a, a recalibration of, of who we are. It's like when you're at the mall and you're just lost and you go to the directory and you, you find that little star on the map that says, you are here. And as we look at the goodness of God and the greatness of God, our Father who is in heaven, we realize... It's not about us. And we pray, hallowed be your name. I want the passion of my life to be about you. And so we have confidence in God's goodness in prayer. We have humility because of God's greatness in prayer. And we have a passion for God's glory in prayer. And Jesus is leading us here, not with the words but with the heart of prayer. Because the heart of prayer is grounded in not who we are before God, but who God is. He is a good, good Father who is a great, great King. And when we let that sink into our hearts and minds, prayer begins to be kind of this recalibration thing where we, we say, okay, this is where I am, It's not about me. It's about you, God. And I want to pray, hallowed be your name. And I encourage you to to maybe this week practice praying these first two lines of the Lord's Prayer. And just take a moment, and, 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 and there's a thing called praying without words, where you let the words of Scripture sink into your heart and mind. You let the word, Our Father, sink into your heart and mind, and you picture yourself in the arms of a good, good Father, and then you picture the greatness of God who created everything, who reigns over all, who is one day going to establish His kingdom over all. He's going to defeat sin for one once for all, and he has defeated it, and there will be a day where he wipes it off the earth, and he establishes a new good kingdom where there is no pain, no suffering, and when we wrap our minds around that, then we can pray, hallowed be your name. I want to make the passion of my life today about your name and not mine. I'm done with making a name for myself. I want to make a name for you, who you are. And I would, I would venture to say that we cannot pray, hallowed be your name, until we pray, our Father in heaven. Until we grasp that God is closer than we realize and greater than we can imagine. Often when I'm preparing my sermons, I... And thinking about how this intersects with our culture and our world. And actually, I was working on my sermon. I, um, I don't know what I was looking up, but I saw an advertisement for a show that is actually starting tonight on CBS. I am not promoting this show at all. But uh, the show is called God Friended Me. 
and I was intrigued by it, and I, I clicked on it, and actually uh, CBS is airing this show where uh, the whole premise of the show, I got sucked in, I ended up watching the whole first episode. Uh, <laughs> The whole premise of the show is that there's, there's this atheist podcast, is a bunch of millennials, and there's an atheist podcast guy who does this podcast about how God doesn't exist, and how there's no like overarching meaning to life, and then God friends him on social media. He gets a friend request from God, and it's a really cheesy premise. Uh, it's a, and it's kind of a cheesy show, but I watched it because I'm always curious about how Hollywood, how our culture is going to portray a show like that. And as I watched the show, it, it's very much a deistic show. It's, it's saying that there is a God. It's saying that there is a, a God who's out there. And, and the whole premise of the show is that God is this person who connects us all. That he, he, he starts giving uh, friend recommendations to this guy on Facebook. And so he starts meeting these friends in real life and, and finds all these connections. And he's starting to, starting to think that maybe there is a God. And I, what I was uh, troubled by as I watched this first episode was that for many of us, when it comes to prayer, our view of God isn't far from Hollywood's portrayal. That God's this mysterious force out there who maybe like sent us a friend request. But at the end of the day, he's just this mystery that, that connects us all, that gives an overarching design to our world. Maybe he gives us purpose or whatever that is. But when we pray the Lord's Prayer, we are denouncing mere deism. Deism is the belief that God exists. That is all that CBS is portraying in that show. We, when we pray the Lord's Prayer, we denounce that kind of view of God. And we bring on a view of God that God is as close as a father. He's not this mysterious force out in the universe. But he is greater than our minds can comprehend. And the Christian view of God, especially as we think about coming to Him in prayer, is that God is closer than we realize, and He's greater than we can imagine. And in that, God is not simply a piece of the world that connects us all. He is a Father who grounds us in truth. He is a God who reigns as our king. And when we wrap our minds around that, we can make the glory of God, his name, the passion of our lives. So I encourage you. Would you take five minutes each day this week and just pray the first two lines of the Lord's Prayer? But do it not with those words. Make your own words and wrap your mind around the goodness of our God as our Father, the greatness of God as our King. And then pray, God, I want the passion of my life today to be the glory of your name.